Welcome to Smash Metafiction, the side project of Smash Fiction where we put aside our differences and work not to pit characters against each other, but to unite them together in search of a common goal. And this is our first attempt at a fun little game that we like to call Surprise Party. Thousands of years ago, the Dark Lord Sauron was defeated on the field of battle and the One Ring of Power lost. All thought the lands of Middle-earth safe from his burning eye, but as long as the One Ring exists, Sauron cannot be truly killed. Now, the orcs begin to mass in great numbers, and the dreaded Ringwraiths ride from Mordor, making their way through the lands of men and elves on a course to the Shire, where they seek the One Ring currently in possession of an especially hapless hobbit by the name of Frodo Baggins. Of course, you probably know this story already. You know how Frodo, along with his gardener and a couple of buddies, joined up with Gandalf the Grey and Aragorn and made their way to the elven city of Rivendell, where a proper adventuring party was formed to take care of this whole nasty Sauron business once and for all. But let's be real, the Fellowship of the Ring had some flaws. There was internal racism, and secret motives, and some pretty dramatic balance issues. I mean, seriously, no one rolled a cleric. Guys! <laughs> no also, wonder... it was boring. <laughs> I, there also, were four... we got, we got it's four boring. hobbit thieves. <laughs> four zero-level <laughs> hobbit thieves. So, like, it's no wonder that the Fellowship largely falls apart by the end of the first book. <laughs> what we need here is some fresh blood. What we need, in short, is a crossover. And, of course... No extended crossover discussion would be complete without a panel of enthusiastic and well-informed Smash Fiction hosts. I'm Dan Mulcairn, and I will be casting my merciless and fiery eye upon this episode as host and judge. Joining me is Kit Mulcairn. Oh shit, are we supposed to have a stinger? What's the thing that Kit says? <laughs> Chuckle fucks. <laughs> Claire Mulcairn. Catchphrase? <laughs> <laughs> and Miles Schneiderman. I seriously thought you were going to say dinguses instead of Smash Fiction hosts, and it makes me a little bit sad that you didn't. I mean, they're kind of synonymous with each other at this point, so, you I mean, know. Okay, fair. That's, that's fair. That's Use fair. your preferred term for the exact same thing. <laughs> so, as mentioned before, this is a game called Surprise Party, and we are taking a classic team-centric story, in this case, the story of Lord of the Rings, and we are replacing the central characters with characters from other fictional properties. Each of the Smash Fic hosts here with me will create their own party to escort Frodo from Rivendell to the fires of Mount Doom, in the hopes that we can finally get rid of that pesky ring. Once each of the advocates here has their teams created, I will present them with challenges that they encounter along the way. The advocates will take turns choosing a character from their team and explain how that character deals with that challenge. After that point, their chosen character is unusable for the remainder of the game. At the end of each challenge, I'll decide privately which character met the challenge the best and award points to the advocates accordingly, and then we will move on. At the end of the game, when Sauron is finally defeated, I will see which advocate had the most points, and they and their party will be declared the winner. So, first off, let's choose your characters. And, in order to do that, we're going to be rolling initiative. So let's see those d20s fly. Six. Six for Claire. Eighteen. Eight. Eight for Kit, and eighteen for Miles. The order will be Miles, Kit, and Claire, but this order will be rotating every round so that everyone gets a chance to go first. The first character slot each of you will be filling is that of the fighter. The fighter is the character who holds the front line against encroaching enemies. Traditionally, they tend to be strong and tough, but a fighter can just as easily be fast and precise, or perhaps they just have a power that makes them uniquely suited to getting up close and personal with foes. Miles, who is your fighter? Uh, my fighter is a character that we haven't had yet on Smash Fiction, which I think is a crime, personally. Despite all the doubters and the naysayers, I, I still nay. believe in my heart, <laughs> after all these years, that this individual could defeat Batman. 
uh, you are referencing an extremely obscure, long-running <laughs> argument that between you and me, I insist that Batman could beat Johnny Cage, My who I guess is, is your Johnny first Cage. fighter. Johnny Cage from Mortal Kombat. Would All you like right. to briefly describe Johnny Cage for the audience? Johnny Cage is a uh, fighter in the Mortal Kombat games. He uh, generally goes around uh, with no shirt but a pair of sunglasses. Because that's just how Johnny rolls. Phrase that uh, way, he, it makes it sound like he's wearing a pair of sunglasses as a shirt. <laughs> just <so you> know. <laughs> Johnny is a cocky, arrogant martial arts B-movie actor who is a really awesome hand-to-hand fighter and also like has the ability to throw green energy stuff around and like do weird green slidey moves, and he's awesome. Okay. Kit, who is your fighter? Godzilla. I'm just playing, I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> I is that going to be it. a joke for every character slot? <laughs> oh, let me change everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to go with Wexter. Wexter from Axe Cop. Yes. Okay, would you like to explain who Wexter is? Wexter is a Tyrannosaurus Rex with Gatling guns instead of his tiny T-Rex arms. And he wears sunglasses because he's a super cool dude. <laughs> okay, Wexter is Kit's fighter. I love it. He is the right. noble steed of Axe Cop. So far, both fighters notable for wearing sunglasses all the time. Yep. I like it. All right, Claire, who is your sunglasses wearer? I mean, uh, fighter. Please say Blade. Please say Blade. Please, please say, say Blade. S- Squirtle Squad Squirtle. Cyclops. <laughs> well, mine does not wear sunglasses, but they are slidey and have green energy. It is Buttercup from the Powerpuff Girls. Okay. Nice. Would you like to describe Buttercup briefly? Yeah, so Buttercup is, I think she's probably about like four years old. She has, well, actually, she's probably like, a year old. She was created by a scientist in a strange accident and sprang forth from a vat of Chemical X as a four-year-old with basically sort of Superman-level powers, flying and laser beam eyes and invulnerability and super speed and stuff like that. She's very feisty. She's the sort of ill-tempered one of the group, the one who's most likely to get angry and frustrated and stuff like that. She's great, and I love her. She's the best. Buttercup. Excellent. A strong field of fighters so far. The next character slot is the Rogue. Now, all of your characters will have their own unique skills, but the Rogue takes their skill focus to a different level. Rogues are often fast and sneaky, preferring to fight from the shadows or from a position of tactical superiority. Rogues are typically known for possessing skills like lockpicking, pickpocketing, and trap disarming. Kit, who is your Rogue? Uh, Dan, I'm gonna have to go with a Xenomorph. A Xenomorph! <laughs> From Alien. You know would, it. would you care to describe a xenomorph to the audience? They're a parasitic alien species. Are, are we going to have any humans from your side? Out of are any of your characters capable of speech? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, let me look. <laughs> yes. I like that she doesn't know. Yes, okay, some of them. <laughs> okay, all right, continue. So a xenomorph is a parasitic alien species that has multiple stages of its life. Much like a parasitic wasp, part of their life stage is within the body of another organism, say, a human. And when that little larva stage is done, you know, done growing up, it busts out of the chest and becomes a super strong, beautiful, black skeletal looking monstrosity. With acid blood. With a lot of stuff going for it. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. All right, great. Claire, who is your rogue? I'm going to go with Ant-Man, as he appears in the MCU. Okay, so right. Scott, Lang Scott Lang, as played by Paul Rudd. Yeah. Excellent. Would you like to describe Ant-Man? He is a legit, like, thief. He was a sort of cat burglar thief in a previous life before he became a superhero. And he also inherited a whole bunch of gadgets that let him change his size. So he can shrink, but still retain the strength of a full-grown man, even when he's the size of an ant. He also has these little disc things that he can throw that can make other objects shrink or grow when he when he hits them. And he has the ability to uh, control ants. That's a great character choice. Absolutely. Miles, who is your rogue? My rogue, for those who have seen this show, I realize it's been a long time, is Max Guevara from Dark Angel. Wow. <laughs> That is an obscure poll, sir. I I don't even know who that (laughs) character is. I mean, I know that it's a Jessica Alba TV show. Tell us about this person. She fits the the rogue character because she is basically a cat burglar, essentially, by night. And also happens to be a super strong, super soldier, warrior person who was genetically bred for awesomeness. Okay, very good. The third character slot is the mage. 
The mage is able to alter the world in a wide variety of ways, whether that means conjuring elemental forces, manipulating enemy minds, or warping space and time. Despite the name, a mage character does not need to use magic per se. Characters who make use of psychic powers, superhero-style powers, or even super science gadgetry could all be considered mages. Claire, who is your mage? I'm going to pick Yoda. Ooh, very good. Yoda from Star Wars. Tell us about Yoda. Uh, he's a 900-year-old <laughs> tiny green alien who's the most powerful force user kind of ever, probably. And I figured he'd be a good sort of guide and mentor character on this sort of journey where the characters are going to probably encounter a lot of tough moral decisions. So in addition to all of his force using powers, I thought he would be just a good sort of center of the party to have along. So He's a real Gandalf type, for sure. Real Gandalf type. Miles, who is your mage? All right, I don't... I mean, okay, I guess Yoda's here, so I could probably use this character. You said Doctor Strange was available, so I figured I could use this character, and that she's not too overpowered. My mage is going to be, assuming it's allowed, Bryn Omsford from the Shannara series. I have not read Shannara, so I can't rightly say, so you'll have to, uh, you'll have to explain who that is. Bryn has a magical ability called the Wish Song. She kind of bends the world around her to however she wants it to be. She's shown in the book, The Wish Song of Shannara, making trees go through their seasonal cycles more quickly than they otherwise would. She's shown using the magic that she possesses as a weapon to, like, drive people insane. It's implied maybe liquefy their brains. She has used it to draw poison out of a person to prevent him from dying. It's incredibly versatile. It's based on what she sings and wishes for. Wow. Okay, that's an interesting character choice. For the benefit of the listener, we decided that the limit for how powerful a character can be in this is similar to what it is in League, which is that you can't have someone who's more powerful than Superman. So Miles brought this up because this is one that might be a little bit on the line. Yeah, what I think keeps her from going over that line is the fact that her character personality is that of kind of the reluctant heroine. She's a very moral individual. She doesn't really want the wish song. She doesn't really want to use it to its fullest extent. She just does when she has to. Yep, I'm totally fine with that. Kit, who is your mage? The origin of all that is good, mother to us <laughs> all. Amaterasu. <laughs> very good. <laughs> Amaterasu right. from Okami. Tell us about Amaterasu. So, O for three on the talkers thus far. Yeah, I was about to say... <laughs> Uh, she's the origin of all this good, mother to us all. She is, in her video game, the sun goddess, who just so happens to take the form of a beautiful white wolf. She's got all manner of, mostly like nature-centric abilities. Yep. You know, like making the goddamn sunrise. I mean, that's, that's an impressive trick for sure. The fourth character slot is the cleric. The cleric's focus is on healing and or protection. Sometimes this ability will be tied to a god or divinity in some way, but that's not at all a prerequisite. As long as the character is geared toward playing defensively and helping to aid their allies, they can make a fine cleric. Miles, who is your cleric? My cleric is Dr. Faiza Hussein from Ooh, Marvel Comics. Excalibur from Marvel. Yeah, otherwise known as Excalibur, sometimes known as Captain Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Tell us about Dr. Faiza Hussein. Faiza is, she is actually a doctor. Basically, what she can do is she can disassemble things and then fix them. So, for example, she heals people. But the way she heals people is that, like, your body is disassembled into its various components. And then she kind of, like, sees the problem and, and instinctually knows how to fix it. It's psychic surgery, in a sense, or, like, telekinetic surgery. She is also uh, the wielder of Excalibur. <laughs> yeah, no, she's great. That's an excellent pick for a cleric. Kit, who is your cleric? Yuna from Final Fantasy X. All right, tell us about Yuna. She is a summoner and white mage, so she can do healing magic, but she can also summon gigantic hashtag godlike creatures. Yes. <laughs> to do uh, her bidding. Yeah, that's a great choice. Very versatile. Hey, she can talk. Look at that. <laughs> Watch me lose that character. But, she summons, right, but a nobody... of, she summons a number of characters who don't talk. So the problem like is nobody out. wants her to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will not argue with you on that. You just brought her along because she's like your backup way of sneaking in like a dozen more non-speaking characters. <laughs> yeah, that's <into> right. <laughs> Claire, who is your cleric? I think I'm going to go with Moira from Overwatch. 
Claire, that was my second choice. That is so funny. Yeah. Wow, you guys I- are on the same wavelength. Claire, tell us about Moira. Okay, so she's a geneticist. She does a lot of cutting edge research in terms of like all sorts of weird medical stuff. Practically speaking, in the game when you're actually playing her though, she functions as sort of like a half healer, half a tacky killy person thing. She wears this backpack full of chemicals and she has little sprayers in her palms and she can like shoot like a healing mist that can regenerate people or she can shoot out like weird poisonous mist things. Also, she got these little, like, balls of energy that, like, will bounce around the battlefield and heal everyone around them or damage everyone around them. And she's very, very good at either healing or damaging large groups of people. And I figured that would be a good thing to have in case we get into any battles with thousands and thousands of orcs. So mm, I don't think that's very likely. Yeah. But, you know, good, good thinking anyway. <laughs> the fifth character slot is the Bard. This character, first and foremost, is a social character and may end up being the face of your party. Whether the bard accomplishes tasks through charm and persuasion, veiled threats, or just plain lies, their words are their primary weapon. In true D&D fashion, however, it also does help if the bard has a smattering of other talents and abilities in addition to their people skills. Kit, who is your bard? The savior of the goddamn galaxy, Commander Shepard. Commander Shepard. Clearly great at music. We've seen those dance skills, right? That's right. (laughs) Tell us about Commander Shepard from Mass Effect. Commander Shepard works for a group that is like kind of above the law and winds up getting pulled into this giant galactic issue of a very spoopy... (laughs) A race of AI that are trying to kill everything else, basically. Basically, Commander Shepard is a badass soldier, but they can also be um, specialized in biotics, which is kind of like Mass Effect's version of being psychic, or they can be very good at like tech stuff. Versatile character, but always inspiring. Yes, Shepard's ability to influence people is a pivotal skill in the course of the Mass Effect series, so good choice. Are you going with Fem Shep or Male Shep? A femme, obviously. Femme chef, all right. Are you picking a class? I think I'm going to go with the Vanguard. A shotgun expert. Yes. Very good. Claire, who is your bard? I'm going to go with Eddie Riggs from Brutal Legend. Uh, (laughs) Ah, very good choice. Tell the audience about why it's such a good choice. Okay, so Eddie Riggs is a roadie from like modern day Earth who ends up transported to a weird magical world where he ends up getting a magical axe named the Separator and a magical guitar called Clementine. He also discovers while he is there that his father came to this place years ago and he is the son of that guy. And also he discovers that he's half demon. So he has some demon powers. He's a really inspiring leader and he has a whole bunch of magical powers that he gets from his guitar. He can summon a magical hot rod called the Druid Plow. So my party is going to be cruising around in a hot rod. What is it called? Uh, the Druid Plow. It's also called Deuce, he calls it, or The Deuce at times. I don't quite know you are, why. You but... are absolutely not allowed to take characters from Liz's fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie Riggs is definitely a Liz Logan type character yeah, for sure. Much. Miles, who is your bard? Uh, my bard is someone that I recently almost got to play on League, the Marquis de Carabas. Mm, yes, from Neverwhere. The Marquis was on your uh, poll as a potential character for you to play, and the patrons very nearly chose that character for you. Yep. All right, tell us about the Marquis. The Marquis is a very charismatic, often insufferable, but still very charismatic individual. His two primary things that he does is he makes deals with people, and he knows a lot of shit. The Marquis de Carabas deals in favors, and he does things for people on the condition that they will owe him a favor, and then he uses that to, like, cash in on something that he wants. He also just has a seemingly endless wealth of knowledge and, like, resources. I have this. You can have it. Now just owe me a favor. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds 100% like a very useful part to have. And finally, we come to the sixth character slot. The Dumpus. (laughs) The Dumpus may not appear in most standard issue players' handbooks, but rest assured, (laughs) most D&D parties have at least one, regardless of what class they may have written on their character sheet. The Dumpus is a character who, regardless of what skills they may or may not possess, are much more likely to be a hindrance and liability to the party than an actual asset. The Dumpus is a unique character slot because the advocates won't be selecting their own character for this. Instead, they will be choosing a Dumpus for each other. 
Claire, who is Miles's Dumpus? Miles's Dumpus is going to be Dennis Nedry from Jurassic Park. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> Tell us about Dennis Nedry from Jurassic so Park. So Dennis's only real skill is that he's a hacker, which is going to be completely useless in this setting. Furthermore, the only time that he has to do anything sort of action related, he fails and shows himself to be horrifically clumsy. And he's also a traitor. He's horrifically <laughs> greedy and will turn on the party at the first opportunity, <laughs> which might come up if there's a magic ring trying to tempt you in the party. So, oh, yeah. That's excellent. Miles, who is Kit's Dumpus? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Kit's Dumpus is Peter Lowe. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> oh, that's My not what we're going for. My favorite worthless piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> They're not supposed to like it, Kit. All right, Peter Lowe from Vampire's Kiss. Uh, Miles, why don't you tell us a little bit about Peter Lowe? Uh, he thinks he's a vampire, but he's not. He is a vampire! <laughs> and so am I. That's all we need to know about Mr. Lowe. Kit, who is Claire's dumpus? Zoidberg! Zoidberg oh, yeah. from Futurama! Tell us about Zoidberg, Kit. <laughs> He's this uh, lobster alien man who's supposed to be a doctor, but he's just stupid. I don't, I mean, yeah. <laughs> he hasn't really accomplished anything <laughs> yep. in Futurama. Consistently Great. incompetent. An excellent choice for the Dumpus. Each of you now has a party of six characters, but this is Smash Fiction, so we can't just let this thing go without a little bit of chaos. Uh, of we not. are going to play a quick round of musical chairs where you will be randomly exchanging a character with a character from another advocate's roster. So each of you, please roll a d6. Miles, what did you roll? I rolled a one. Okay. Miles, you will be giving Johnny Cage to Kit. I don't want oh, Johnny no. Cage. <laughs> so, I only need two cages. So Kit, you now have Johnny Cage. <laughs> Kit, what did you roll? Four. Kit, you will be giving Yuna to Claire. All right. You're welcome. Claire, what did you roll? Uh, I rolled a two. Claire, you will be giving Ant-Man to Miles. Sweet. I was really hoping that one of us was going to end up with two Dumpus characters. That would have been great. <laughs> I know. I kind of was too. Yeah. Miles, please introduce your fellowship to the world. Oh my god. All right. So my fellowship consists of Max Guevara from Dark Angel, Faiza Hussein from Marvel Comics, Scott Lang from the MCU, Bryn Omsford from The Wish Thong of Shannara, and the Marquis de Carabas from Neverwhere, as well as Dennis Nedry from Jurassic <laughs> Park. Kit, introduce your fellowship, please. I've got Wexter as my fighter, a Xenomorph as my rogue, the origin of all that is good mother to us all, Amaterasu as my mage, Johnny Cage as my <laughs> other fighter. <laughs> yeah, you lost your cleric. No, I think he's going to be a cleric. He's going to just learn to be a cleric real quick. Uh, I've got Commander Shepard as my bard, and I've got Peter Lowe as my dolphin. <laughs> You're welcome, kid. And Claire, who is your fellowship? We have Buttercup from Powerpuff Girls as the fighter, Yoda from Star Wars as the mage, both Moira from Overwatch and Yuna from Final Fantasy as my clerics, Eddie Riggs from Brutal Legend as a bard, and as my dumpus, I have... Why not Zordberg? Oh wait, I can't do that one. <laughs> <laughs> Each of your parties joins up with your respective Frodo's and set out from Rivendell heading for Mordor. Chapter 1, The Bridge of Khazad Dun. Having departed the otherworldly elven city of Rivendell, your party travels south through the forests and fields of Holland. After the road over the mounted Caradhras proves impassable, you decide to cut through the mines of Moria. This proves to be a bit trickier than you might have thought. Before you even get through the gate, you have to deal with a creature in a lake, and then once inside, you find the shadowy halls filled with orcs and trolls. Just as you arrive at the Great Bridge in Khazad Doom, feeling like the worst is behind you, up from the shadows beneath the bridge rises a towering demonic creature wielding weapons made of flame. The dwarves of Moria dug too deeply and awoke a ferocious Balrog. And you're going to have to deal with this creature in some way if you want to escape the mines. Miles, tell me which character you choose and how they deal with this challenge. So I feel like Ant-Man gets super huge. And, uh, you know, swatting away orcs with every step and makes like to engage with the Balrog in like massive monster combat and then flings a thing at it and makes it tiny. <laughs> and it falls back into the cavern because it's all tiny. That's a good gambit. Very good. Kit, uh, which character do you pick and how do they deal with this? 
Well, in the original story, it was a mage that dealt with this problem, correct? Yes. So I think I'm just going to have to go with the origin of all that is good mother to us all, Tarasu, because <laughs> uh-huh. she's fought her, her share of demons and shit. Sure. Can we get a, a sound clip of her saying, fly you fools? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> What'd she say? Just run. <laughs> Wait, no, you don't have two characters who can talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry, how is Amaterasu dealing with this? Straight up fighting it. Just straight up she fighting it. She has incredible agility. She's got all manner of like natural weapons to deal with it. Slice, chops, water. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Claire, how about you? I think we're going to go with Yuna. There's a lot of times in Final Fantasy X where you square off against another summoner and they'll summon some big, horrible monster and Yuna has to take it in a one-on-one fight and summon one of her own summons to try to to beat it and it's kind of about like knowing the right summon for the job and i think clearly when she looks at this baller i'm just gonna say all right this is clearly like a fire dude so i'm gonna bring out shiva and i think that the baller is really bad about telegraphing his attacks you know he has that fire whip you can see it coming from a mile away so she'll get diamond dust charged in no time it won't even be a thing all right it's possible that one of you fell into the abyss fighting this ball rock, but everyone else gets to move on so i guess we can call this one a win chapter two Treebeard. The chaos never really ends for the Fellowship. Even after escaping the Mines of Moria, you find yourselves harried by orcs and Urukai at every step. Eventually, you make the fateful decision to split the party. One of your characters will continue traveling with Frodo deeper into Mordor, while the larger party will act to gather allies and draw away the attention of Sauron's minions. This next part isn't a full challenge, just a complication. Each of you will have to choose a character to go with Frodo, effectively making that character unavailable for future challenges. This is the person who will be responsible for protecting Frodo. So, choose wisely. Ooh. Kit, who do you choose to accompany Frodo? Interesting. Well, I probably shouldn't leave him with the Xenomorph. (laughs) (laughs) I think the most appropriate thing is actually... To have Wexter be his steed. Okay, so <laughs> Frodo's gonna ride a dinosaur with Gatling gun arms and sunglasses into Mordor. <laughs> yeah, who gonna fuck with that? <laughs> Come on, Nazgul, let's go. It turns out sometimes you do simply walk into Mordor. <laughs> <laughs> Claire, who are you choosing to go with Frodo? Oh, this is definitely a job for Yoda, no question. <laughs> yeah, uh, good choice. Y- Fair Yoda enough. can just ride on Frodo like a little backpack, even though it occurs to me that Yoda's probably about two thirds as tall as Frodo. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever it's fine it's a heavy um, backpack you know yeah. that's for serious training yeah yeah indeed and you know along the way he can give him all sorts of life lessons teach him stuff we'll see maybe frodo's a little bit force sensitive i don't know i'm just saying who knows what could sure, happen sure. so yeah sounds good miles how about you i'm gonna go with fiza okay fiza hussein accompanies frodo into mordor i think she is best suited to ensure that he survives the journey so with that we are moving on to the actual challenge of this chapter. The bulk of your party decides to cut through nearby Fangorn Forest. There, you find that the tree-like giants known as Ents are uncharacteristically hostile to you. It seems as though the wizard Saruman has been cutting down trees to help fuel Sauron's engines of war. How are you going to deal with this? Are you going to side with the Ents, manipulate them into distracting Saruman so you can slip by, ignore the situation entirely, or something else? Kit, you're up first. So it sounds like there might be a little bit of uh, negotiations with this, this tree race, right? That is one way of handling it, yes. You know, if there's anyone who could get a whole race on their side, it's motherfucking Commander Shepard. Okay, uh, tell me how this goes down. Seduction. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Shepard probably winds up having to do some kind of mission for like, the leader of the ants. Always a fetch quest. It's always some kind of fucking rescue bullshit, isn't Mm -hmm. it? And then afterwards, the ant specter will be like, yeah, (laughs) you legit. (laughs) Claire, it's your go. I think this is definitely a job for Eddie Riggs. There are multiple times throughout the game Brutal Legend where you will start off fighting a faction of bad guys and then you'll like discover that they're sort of oppressed or being forced to serve against their will or something and you'll like go take out the boss and turn them he's all about this he's all about like overthrowing the people and setting the people free and and then they join the army like that's his whole deal so okay very good miles let's hear it the person who will be assigned to this task is one dennis nedry 
So here's how it's going to go down. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, I forgot. We so, actually have to use these guys at some point. Yeah, we, yeah, we do. I've just been pretending they don't exist. I'm really hoping Peter Lowe gets to throw the ring into the volcano. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Lowe's definitely becoming Gollum before the end of this movie. <laughs> so Dennis, about this time is when he chooses to sneak away, shall we say. He's seen enough. He's fucking leaving. He's cutting his losses. He starts going through the forest. Of course, because it's Dennis, he happened to choose the time when, like, a fucking rainstorm was happening. <laughs> this, like, huge storm comes down, right? And, like, he's blindly stumbling around. Maybe he's going in circles. He doesn't really know. He just he can't see. His glasses are all, like, muddy and shit. And a bolt of lightning strikes a tree right next to him and, like, barely misses him. But it takes the tree down, right? And the ant's tree beard comes up because he actually didn't go very far, you know. And tree beard shows up and he's like, what happened? Who did this? And Dennis, because he's, you know, constantly trying to shift the blame to somebody else, like, uh, uh, I don't know, man. It was, it was, a, a, a somebody came up and I said, I don't know. Somebody just kind of came up and, and knocked him down. I, I, I think it was a white guy. And uh, Treebeard's like, Saruman. <laughs> and then he goes to war, like the last march of the ants happens, and uh, and he goes to war against Saruman. Nice. Strategic weaseling. I like it. <laughs> Chapter 3, Helm's Deep. With the events of Fangorn Forest behind you, your party finds its way to Helm's Deep, the great stronghold of Rohan. Here, you find that many of the Rohirrim have taken shelter within the thick stone walls of this fortress, and not a moment too soon, for an army of 10,000 Urukai have assembled to lay siege, and they've brought explosives with them. This will be a trying battle for all involved, but I trust that your characters will be able to hold their own until reinforcements arrive. But of course, the Battle of Helm's Deep is most known for the unlikely friendships formed by siblings in arms. For this challenge, you will choose two of your characters— and describe how they learn to work together during this battle, and what sort of relationship they have moving forward as a result. Claire, you are up first for this challenge. Which two characters are you going with? Oh man, there's not a lot of options left, so I guess I'm going with Moira and Zoidberg. <laughs> <laughs> the two doctors, I like That's it. good. Moira and Zoidberg, uh, tell me about their relationship during the Battle of Helm's Deep. I think that they're both going to be sort of working to, uh, to heal people, and Zoidberg basically doesn't have a lot of knowledge and will oftentimes, like, accidentally, while trying to heal someone, like, remove one of their limbs or remove some <laughs> important organ. But he has so much advanced, like, future science technology that's sort of idiot proof that he kind of bumbles his way through it. I mean, that's sort of how it seems to be whenever he's, like, healing Fry or something like that. Maybe, like, Moira helps him out a little bit and being, like, slightly less of a dingus. I see in general, too, that, like, what they end up bonding over in the end is that, in a way, they're both kind of outcasts. Moira has been cast out by the scientific community because she's too extreme in her research methods, and she, like, meddles with things that, you know, ought not be meddled in, that sort of thing. And Zoidberg is an outcast just because he's he's Zoidberg. He's just kind of generally off-putting to be around. Um, <laughs> and they realize they're not so different. They're both kind of, like outcasts on the side they're both sort of doctors to varying degrees and uh yeah <laughs> that's beautiful a friendship for the ages for yeah. sure miles you're next which characters step up for this challenge so i'm gonna go with max guevara and the marquis de carabas okay they have commonalities right from the beginning being that they're both street smart they also have the commonality of being you know the criminal with the heart of gold kind of characters there's an instant vibe there but they don't immediately get off on the right foot. Max, for one thing, sees the Marquis as, like, not at all a fighter of any kind or a warrior, whereas she, you know, while she is first and foremost a thief, she definitely values her own ability to scrap it up when she needs to. For the Marquis's part, he is just kind of confused by her. She's, like, a mystery to him in terms of who she is and how she was created. But the thing about the Marquis is that when it comes time to fight, he will fucking fight. He gets killed in Neverwhere to get information and returns and then proceeds to, like, fight people with crossbows and stuff. He is going to really step up during the Battle of Helm's Deep and earn Max's respect. And 
In the meantime, through their interactions, Max realizes that here's a person who has been around so much weird shit over the course of his life that he really doesn't care what kind of weird animal DNA is inside her. Like, isn't he going to judge her by that kind of shit? Because he's seen so much, he's interacted with so many different kinds of people in London below, he's not going to judge her, and uh, his curiosity about her is more of like, hey, maybe we can like work together, and maybe I can learn more about you, and we can learn more about each other. So, a beautiful friendship forms. I agree. That does sound beautiful indeed. Kit, we are down to you. Weave me a word picture. So, it's going to have to be the cages, if you will. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So at first they're going to hate each other. They're both kind of cocky in their own ways, right? Mm -hmm. Miles, you'll have to confirm certain things about Johnny Cage for me. He's very sure. cocky. <laughs> yeah, yes. he's like Cockiness an actor type. One of his, his finishing thing. moves is he gives someone an autographed oh, picture of himself. Beautiful. Yeah. They start off like really hating each other throughout this whole thing. Pretty sure Johnny tries to push Peter into the Balrog pit at some point, but <laughs> <laughs> Avatarasa doesn't let it happen. Then one day, Cage realizes that Peter is actually just, just kind of off and he feels sorry for him. And then he sees Peter do this amazing fatality on a pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> and he decides to take him under his wing, if you will. Oh. And, and really like, you know, coming from the actor angle, decides to do this like, okay, okay. So you're a vampire. I believe you. How can we work with that theme <laughs> to really like make you feel like a proper fighter? Because all the fighters have themes where, where Cage comes from, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's true. So they both come to a, a newfound understanding and respect for each other. And Peter becomes a little less of a dumpus uh. and maybe more of a vampire. <laughs> and no pigeon is safe. Wow. That is delightful and terrifying. I like it a lot. <laughs> Chapter four, the battle of the Pelennor Fields. This is it. The single largest battle of the War of the Ring. Thousands and thousands of humans stand against even greater numbers of orcs, uruks, trolls, and elephants the size of buildings. To make matters worse, the Witch King of Angmar himself, the leader of the Ringwraiths, leads the monstrous forces of Mordor. Everything rides on the outcome of this battle. Choose a character who will determine how the forces of light prevail, even if they have to go get help from the Army of the Dead to do so. Miles, we are starting with you. This is the proper time and why I have been saving Brunomsford. Makes sense. Let's hear what she does. First of all, if Bryn wants the help of the Army of the Dead, she can get it by making them help. Because she can use the Wish Song to convince them that helping is the thing they should do. Again, Bryn doesn't usually resort to any of this stuff until the stakes are at their highest, as they are here. Uh, as for winning the rest of the battle, I mean, she is just going to be a singing machine of destruction in this uh, contest. There's going to be pieces of the earth flung around, trees are flying through the air, giant gusts of wind flying everywhere, armies scattered to said winds. Bryn is going to unleash the raw power of the Wish Song, and nobody is going to be able to stand up to that. Nice. Kit, it is your turn. How could a xenomorph... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did not establish that it was a queen xenomorph. I did just say a xenomorph. Yes, in well, my mind it was a drone. Okay, well, we didn't say adjectives, so <laughs> can I establish that it is, oops, it was a queen. I guess. So, Suddenly an alien queen. So we have our own army now, and it's uh -huh. made out of their army. <laughs> we don't need your fucking dead people. We're going to make I mean, more dead people <laughs> in a hot second. Oh, guess what? You ain't never seen Oliphant Xenomorph. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm really sorry, Lord of the Rings world. <laughs> yeah. You've just now, you have a new problem. This, this yeah. turned out very bad. We're, 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 we're saved from Sauron. Oh, wait. <laughs> Hold on. Wasn't Kit's Xenomorph her rogue? <laughs> yeah, it sure was. <laughs> Is yeah. the alien queen her rogue? <laughs> <laughs> Not the sneakiest individual when you have a giant ovipositor hanging up. Oh, uh, when you can make rogues, you're a rogue. <laughs> oh, I see. So your rogue is a rogue factory. Yep. Got My invested rogue is a in rogue infrastructure. Factory. I want I want that as a bumper sticker. <laughs> okay. And Claire, who's charging into this battle? Oh, definitely Buttercup. I'm so glad that this is what I got mm. at the end. So um yeah. For those of you who don't watch a lot of Powerpuff Girls. Generally, whether or not they can defeat the bad guys in a fight is not what the episode is about, because that would not be a very interesting episode. Oftentimes, they will defeat villains in, like, 
one or two quick still images and then it will just move on because it's not worth getting into. Like, Buttercup is just gonna feed everyone just by herself in like eight seconds and it won't even be a thing. That's very good. Quite an epic battle indeed. Which brings us to chapter five, Shelob's Lair. We now cut to the land of Mordor itself, where Frodo, accompanied by the character I had you pick back in chapter two, draws ever closer to Mount Doom. Sadly, this strange babbling creature that served as their guide and mumbled to itself seems to have led our heroes astray, for they find themselves unexpectedly trapped in a labyrinthine series of caves. Worse yet, the further they go, the more they begin to see gigantic webs, many of which contain the remains of humans and orcs. Just then, Frodo is yanked from his feet with a yelp. The massive spider known as Shelob has found you, and Frodo has been poisoned and imprisoned in a web. Let's hope you made a good character choice back in Chapter 2, because they have a tough challenge ahead of them now. Kit, tell me how this goes down with Wexter. Oh, dead spider bodies everywhere. <laughs> you kidding me? He can breathe fire on the spiders. He can shoot them with his gun arms. <laughs> Right. He also has, and I quote, a super duper fast bite. That's true. Super duper fast. Uh, one of my favorite things, besides the sunglasses, is he can sprout spikes if bad guys try to ride him. So if any spiders try to jump onto his back to prison with their fangs, well, spiky time. Excellent. Yeah. So, Claire, let's hear how Yoda does. This is a very similar setting to Dagobah, if you think about it. When you're learning lightsaber fighting, the first style that you learn is actually called Style Zero. Style Zero is about how to solve problems without violence. Yoda is one of the most empathetic characters in all of Star Wars. You get the sense that these are just like, you know, confused, hungry animals, but using his force powers, he would have the ability to get through to them and convince them that these people are not a threat. And if they won't back down, if they're too angry, and if they're too far gone, then this is a really dark and weird and warped place. We've seen that there were like all sorts of weird force illusions that were around on Dagobah, and he could summon forth some sort of big scary thing and just scare them all away. Regardless, he's probably not actually going to have to kill anybody to get Frodo free. All right. Uh, Miles, how are things going with Dr. Hussein? Uh, they're going great. So, if you recall in the original Lord of the Rings uh, story, Samwise Gamgee kills Shelob with a sword? A magic sword, but yes. Certainly a magic sword. Magic in that it glows blue when orcs are near. That is the <laughs> magic of the sword. Samwise Gamgee is no Faiza Hussein, and that sword is not Excalibur. So, yeah, I don't think it'll take much uh, work on Fize's part to use Excalibur to dispose of the giant spider. And then when the spider is dead, oh no, Frodo is poisoned. Good thing I can magically heal people. Okay. <laughs> so she's going to take him apart, take out the poison, put him back together. Moving on. Very good. A very handy character to have around. And finally, Chapter 6, Mount Doom. Rising above the toxic landscape of Mordor is the gigantic volcano known as Mount Doom, where the One Ring was forged so long ago. And now, the One Ring has returned, carried by one sorry-ass hobbit named Frodo Baggins, and Mr. <laughs> Frodo is all alone. Damn it, I knew we should have gone with seven characters per side. Guys, this isn't good. Frodo is looking pale and sickly, he keeps referring to the ring as the precious, and he seems to have lost his shoes. Oh wait, he was barefoot <laughs> at the start, never mind. I guess that's okay. Anyway, he makes his way up the slopes of Mount Doom and into the great structure of Samoth Nar. But who does he find waiting for him there? It's Sauron himself. The Dark Lord has returned in all his glory. I don't remember this part of the books. <laughs> Sauron stretches out one armored hand and Frodo obediently approaches, preparing to grant Sauron the one object that will make the Dark Lord's conquest of Middle-earth inevitable. But just then, the Chamber of Fire is filled with a blinding white light, as one of Frodo's companions, previously thought lost, returns in this hour of greatest need. One of your previously used characters has returned as their name, The White. <laughs> their one mission, make sure that Sauron is taken care of permanently. It won't be easy, but then again, no one ever said it would be. Claire, who are you bringing back from the dead to save Middle-earth? Or maybe not the dead, maybe just from being a little tuckered out. 
We are definitely going with Yoda. If there was anyone who comes back to guide people and help them, it is Yoda. So Yoda the White is going to appear next to Frodo. Sauron's going to be standing there and saying, What's the matter, Frodo? You don't think you can defeat me? Ah, you're too weak. Draw that sword and strike me down, you know, and that kind of thing. And Frodo's going to pull out his sword, and then Yoda's going to say, like, you know, Oh, no, strike him down not. If you do so, then you will be just like him, you know, blah, blah, blah. The ring is corrupting your mind and all that sort of thing. And so what Frodo then does is he's holding up his sword and he just sets it aside and he just walks up and he walks right through Sauron who vanishes. It was just an illusion that was created by the ring to poison his mind, to trick him to putting on the ring so that he would become powerful enough to fight him. But he didn't actually need to do it. It was just an illusion. And uh, Yoda's there to guide him. Then he throws the ring in and everything's fine. Hooray! Miles, your turn. Make it good. Well, I'm tempted to bring Bryn back for this. Understandably so. She may or may not have kind of sort of been corrupted by dark magic at the end of the Wish Song of Shannara. Mm. <laughs> so I'm actually going to take Claire's same strategy. I'm going to bring Fiza back. Okay. And um, Fiza is going to use her powers to A, temporarily paralyze Sauron, and B, take Frodo apart again, and this time use the fact that the ring is no longer on him because he's in pieces <laughs> to drop it into Mount Doom. Okay, well, that's an interesting use of her dismemberment power, but I like it. And finally, Kit, tell me who makes this last stand against the Lord of the Rings. Oh, oh the origin <laughs> of all this good mother for all of Oh, you thought she fell into the deep pit with the Balrog, but she survived. <laughs> okay, great. Well... It's because she's a goddess. Right. <laughs> you never really die. She comes running back a trail of flowers and grass in her wake wherever she steps, even though it's a volcano. Fuck you, Sauron. Mm-hmm. And much like in the game that she is from, she actually helps Frodo fight Sauron himself. She creates a moon in the sky, which makes his sword extra powerful. And every time he slashes. She also uses her cut attack on him to make the attack extra powerful. And together, they beat back Sauron long enough for Frodo to cast the ring down. And then Peter Lowe jumps in after it. No! <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Cage falls to his knees. <laughs> I'm really enjoying the fanfic the sort of bent that your, your narration oh, is shit, taking. shit, 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 shit. The Marquis de Carabas shows up and reminds Sauron of the favor he owes him. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that would have been good, but sadly, sadly. Uh, All right. Time for me to tally up these points and see who won. Peter Lowe's only weakness, lava. (laughs) And everything else. (laughs) Also the world as a whole. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) This was incredibly close. In third place with 11 points is Kit. In second place, with 12 points, is Claire. Mm. And with 13 points, Miles wins. Yes! It was the Xenomorph army, wasn't it? it? Was, well, that was <laughs> part of it. Because we replaced the bad guy. It was, it was a little... <laughs> yeah, I don't know that how helpful the Xenomorphs would have been. <laughs> uh, uh, did we not kill the army like you asked? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it would have taken you a few weeks, though, is the thing. <laughs> Couple of highlights. Claire, your choice of Eddie was interesting. I agree that both he and Shepard do tend to command people to march against their mutual enemies. However, Eddie is carrying an axe, which the Ents do not like. Mm. Uh, So I had to take that into consideration. Miles, Faiza was the perfect character to help Frodo against uh, against She Love. I knew it. (laughs) Uh, Claire, I I gave you the win on the Balrog because you're the only one who used an elemental weakness argument against him. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Kit, you won the Ent round with Shepard. It was the seduction, huh? You were teetering on the edge, and then you decided to go seduction, and that pushed <laughs> you over. Miles, your buddy comedy in Helm's Deep was my favorite, so you won that round. You also won the round with Bryn, because she just kind of cheats. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. <laughs> but Kit actually won the last round with Amaterasu. I feel like sunshine and fresh air is the bane of Mordor. <laughs> and... <laughs> Therefore, she's the perfect person to take on Sauron. So, uh, well done, everyone. Everyone won first in a round at least once. You guys were very, very close. So, very well Uh, done. Uh, So, Miles, uh, you have vanquished Sauron once and for all. Do you want to give me a quick epilogue showing how each of your characters live out the rest of their days in Middle-earth? 
for Bryn, it's pretty easy. Like, she kind of comes from a fantasy world already. I'm gonna say she finds a nice, like, pastoral setting, like Shady Vale and also Hobbiton. Maybe in Hobbiton, if they'll have her. The Marquis? I mean, Jesus. I don't know. He probably is, He's just wandering the world scamming people. <laughs> <laughs> with his best buddy Max Guevara by his side. Mm -hmm. They're hanging out to have more adventures together. Dennis Nendry uh, was accidentally stepped on by Entz. <laughs> yep. um, and and he, he's dead. <laughs> um, Checks out. Let's see, Scott Lang? I feel like he is hanging out with the Ents because he helped them tear down Saruman's tower by getting all big and ripping it apart. Mm -hmm. So, like, he's good, like friends with, he's good friends with them. And then Faiza, of course is uh, going with the elves to uh, mm. to the, the immortal lands or whatever. Once she gets there, she will uh, use her newfound powers of whatever you get when you go with the elves to the immortal lands to demand the return of her character to the pages of Marvel Comics. Thank you. Damn Skippy. All right. Uh, well, guys, thank you for doing this with me. Listeners, thank you for listening. This is yet another experiment that we are running as part of Smash Metafiction. So any and all feedback that you guys have, uh, if you liked it, if you wanted to see something done differently, if you want to hear more or less of this, all is welcome, as with everything that we do. And join us next week when we'll be back to our normal Smash Fiction matches. I mean, about as normal as it gets, because the match is Blades of Glory versus Yuri on Ice. Guys, do you guys remember when we used to do episodes about people fighting? Mmm, was that us? Did that happen? Ugh, it's been so long. <laughs> there were Nick Cage's involved, right? Smash Metafiction is produced by Miles Schneiderman and production assistant Sharon Schneiderman, with logo design by Claire Mulcair. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for our theme song, Volatile Reaction. You can find us on Twitter at SmashFicPodcast and search for the Smash Fiction Podcast on Facebook, Tumblr, and YouTube. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice, and if you leave us a good review, we shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Smash Fiction is made possible thanks to our supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast. Please consider donating as little as a dollar each month. It helps us keep the show going, and we have great rewards and extra content for those who help us out. If you have any suggestions, feedback, or other contributions, send them to us at smashfictionpodcast at gmail.com and help us continue the fight. I still don't understand what spoopy means. You've explained <laughs> it to me multiple times, and I still don't understand it. it. It's like spooky, but it makes you personally angry, Miles. That's the difference. <laughs> <laughs>